Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Revolutionary Daydreams. It has been more than a minute since you've seen me, but um, I'm really excited to come back to the platform of Revolutionary Daydreams, which is all about inspiring creative energy, making sure that you ignite your creative energy. And today I have a wonderful uh, guy with us today. His name is Frank Hodelin. He is an artist an interior designer, he is a real estate agent, and he's just a generally fabulous man about town. Welcome to Revolutionary Daydreams, Frank Hodlin. Oh, thank you, Nicholas, glad to be here. And so I should say, um, I'm not gonna be all like super, super fancy because I know Frank uh, for a very long time. We're actually friends. <laughs> we are, 15 but years? It's, what, just like what, six months, what is it? <laughs> You, I met you when you were 12. No, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, elementary school. Elementary yeah. school, yeah. Um, we met about, you know, in New York City, you know, one of those nights in Chelsea, as one does um, when you're living your life in New York um, back in the day. Uh, but I'm so happy to have you because part of what I think is necessary in these days is, is calling upon your community, your friends. And we all know that these are challenging times that we're living in, and hopefully these are gonna be times where we're breaking through, right? To some, to, to not, not a new normal, but just a way forward that is going to be more authentic for everybody. And why I wanna to talk to my friends and particularly my friends who are artists, because we know the power of art. Art changes lives, art can really um, be, help the conversation on the front lines in a way that other things uh, can. So today I wanna talk a few different things uh, with Frank. I wanna talk about black identity. I wanna talk about uh, the black LGBTQ experience and identity in specific. As I said, we're gonna talk about the power of art. And then we're gonna get into some of Frank's work. So Frank, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself um, and let us know uh, just just where you come from, your practice, and so on and so forth. Sure. Um, well, I'm uh, an Haitian American. My parents were from Haiti. They immigrated here in the 1960s. Um, and I have five brothers and sisters, half of whom were born in Haiti, and the other three of us were born here in the States. So it's kind of an interesting dichotomy there. Um, and yet, you know, they all, they came as children. So we're, we essentially identify as, you know, Americans, um, born and raised right here in New York. And um, it's, it's uh, my parents were, were, were artists. Oh, they were, I didn't know that. Yeah, they were amateur artists. They, they didn't make a living at it necessarily. Uh, my mother was self-taught um, and I think quite talented, quite a good artist. Uh, my dad, also somewhat self-taught, but he actually studied architecture and art in school. So he worked as an architect, which is, you know, kind of an artistic field. Probably where I got my most influence was from my dad, who, you know, I, I actually went into interior design, which is the art architecture field, um, as well as painting. He always painted my whole life. He never really exhibited anything, but I would say was the biggest influence on me, uh, you know, young Frank was watching daddy paint and I wanted to, ooh, I want to push dirt around too like that. How do we do that? You know? Um, and they were, they were different sort of artists, my mom and dad, but definitely sort of influenced who I was. And I, I would say that they had a very sort of um, Haitian quality to their work, but also somewhat more, my mother more impressionistic perhaps. My dad tended to move towards more abstraction. And he was a big fan of Picasso. So his work tended to have more of a flavor like that. Wow. Uh, but yeah, that would be, you know. So grew up I, around the art on your walls. It was just part of your life, your daily life. It was part life. of my life. It was never, yeah, it was never a question that I was going to be an artist. It was the first thing I knew that I was good at and I liked doing. And I, I was just like, this is what I'm going to do. So when I grew up, I went to art school. And I studied right here in New York at Pratt, mm -hmm. Pratt Institute. Um, in the 1980s, <laughs> late 1980s, um, as a child prodigy. No, I, I, <laughs> but um, yeah, I studied art there. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, the, the leaders in the art world are, are, have come out of Pratt. I mean, that's yeah. 
defining school. So yeah, Kadir Nelson, who's in the news a lot this week, he's, he's on a couple of covers of uh, Rolling Stone, and I think the New Yorker. Um, he also went to Pratt. I think he graduated a couple of years after me. We weren't there at the same time, mm -hmm. but uh, yes, um, a lot of people don't know Robert Redford went to Pratt. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Not an interesting detail, but a detail. But a detail, I never realized. <laughs> a detail. So, so when you were at Pratt, what were you studying? I started as a fine art major. Um, I thought I wanted to be a painter or illustrator or, or something like that. I dabbled in graphic art, but I, I kind of knew quickly that wasn't for me. I don't think I wanted to be a graphic artist. Um, it's interesting going to art school, coming from a non art school. I didn't go to a high school of art and design or anything. I went to a you know, pretty ordinary high school, but I started majoring in art while I was there, realized it's what I wanted to do. I was one of the better artists in the high school um, and I got accepted into Pratt. And once I got there, I suddenly wasn't the best anymore. You know, it was like, oh, these are real artists. And you really start to doubt yourself. You know, I was like, oh, um, hmm, am I going to make a living at this? when these three people are so much better at this than I am. Um, in retrospect, you know, that, that was probably just teenage angst. Um, I probably shouldn't have, you know, kind of put myself down that way, yeah. but I got worried and, and my parents were worried, you know, thinking how much money are we spending to send you to this school? And maybe you want to do something a little more practical, you know, particularly parents who uh, from the Caribbean, you know, there, you, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be a teacher, an engineer. There are no other professions, exactly. you know, certainly not art. Yeah, as I, I said, I, I, like I heard recently, like you can be a doc, I literally heard this like a week ago. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, or, you know, or disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? Right. Yes, that's sort of what it comes down to. Um, so try not to be the disappointment. I think, you know, they, for, they sort of wanted me to play it safe. And I guess I, I, I internalized that. And my compromise was I'm not leaving school. I'll become an interior designer because I did have interest in architecture as well. The architecture school at Pratt was amazing, but it's a different school. You, I'd have to basically reapply. Um, so my compromise was to just continue um, at Pratt as an interior design major. And I could still paint and do my little drawings on the side. Um, and I had a pretty good and successful career as a designer. Um, got a job right out of school um, and had, uh, as I said, a good long career. But I always wanted to still be that artist. Yeah, you know? I know we, we have the fortune of seeing you. Uh, you did several, several episodes of The View um, back when and doing the, what was it, the design challenges and redoing um, rooms, those were always yes. fun. The two were like room makeovers. Um, so I was there, go to uh, makeover guy. You know, Oprah had uh, Nate Berkus, and The View had Frank. Uh, <laughs> you talk about that. You talk about um, kind of going away from that. So I, I mean, clearly, we'll cut to the chase. Like your your passion is being a painter, being an artist. Right. You know that is. You know, I've seen your interior design work. It's really great. Um, not to take anything away from that, but what, what I think I hear you're getting at, and we're looking at these beautiful paintings right in the back, in, in the back of you, that that is where your 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 passion lies. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, stepping away from painting, coming back to painting, and that process for you? Sure. Well, I, I never really stepped away from it, but it definitely was on the back burner. You know, I, I focused on my career as a designer, um, but the painting was always there. And it became really, you know, well, I'll do this and it's on the side. And if I can have a couple of shows here and there and I can sell one or two here and there, that's, that's great. Um, and I did, and all of that worked out. And I think as I got into my forties, um, I started to, you know, you, you, there's that sense of, what if I had, what if I hadn't switched majors? What if I had continued doing this? Um, and for a moment I thought, you know, oh, I'm too old. I can't do this. But 40 is not fatal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a commercial, wasn't it? 40 is not fatal. Um, but it's true. I, I decided to really just give it a shot and 
go at it. If, if not full time, at least half the time and then maybe work my way up. So I'd say right now I'm between a 50 to 60 percent artist, still doing interior design, still doing a little bit of real estate on the side. Because let's face it, New York City, you've got to hustle. Yeah. Um, and everyone's got their side hustle. Mm -hmm. But I really don't want those to be the major um, you know, driving force on my 1099 uh, come April 15th. Yeah. I want it to be artist. And it, I, and and I, it that, comes a mindset. I mean, that, the, the mindset exactly is getting at you for, for, for so many people who are, who are watching and kind of grappling with this idea of being an artist. I mean, just the fact to be told you, you are allowed to do multiple things, but you have to try to keep that mindset of, of what is kind of driving you forward, right? I mean, in, in, not just in New York, but in any um, kind of setting, most people have to do multiple things when they're looking at you know, having a career as an artist. But I wanted to uh, get into some of your work and I'm gonna share the screen uh, because, you know, like I say, you know, art is healing and some of these works I think are just, um, just wonderful. Oh, thank you. So the first, I hope we can all see this now. Frank, I'm just going to go th through this. And if you can tell, just give us a little background about these, these paintings and in particularly um, kind of the style and, you know, how they came about. Sure. This first one that we're looking at, that's my dad. Um, the title is Pensive. Um, and he was. To me, he was a very thoughtful, very pensive guy. Um, and and the, the, it's kind of the history of this painting is it didn't start out this way. It started out, it was somewhat abstract, but it was more realistic looking. You know, it, it definitely had more of a resemblance to him and the colors were completely different. Um, and I did it and I, I liked it, but I never loved it. And I kind of put it aside um, for, I'd say a year or two, really. And then one day I picked it up again and, and I just had a flash of how to fix it, you know, what to do. Um, I abstracted it. I, I gave it a much more sort of cubist kind of an attitude. Um, to me, I know you, you don't know what the man looks like, but it still looks like my father. You know, that, that is his profile. Wow. And that, that was a pose he used to do a lot. He would, you know, I would see him sitting at the kitchen table with his chin resting on his hand, thinking about something or, you know, contemplating or sketching out an idea for one of his own paintings. Um, and this is actually sort of the style that he would paint in. Really? So as a tribute to him, that was kind of why it came out looking this way, you know? So let's go to the next one. I'll go to the uh, here. So that is called Searching the Sky. And that is my brother. So that's a companion piece to the picture of my dad. Um, they're obviously two people who are in my life and very close to. Um, and they're very similar. They're, they're similar personalities. Um, and I wanted to capture that, but also I think through the use of the, so, so the pose is similar and that's how they're kind of similar. Um, but the way they're kind of different, you know, my dad was older, he's a good 40, probably 44 years older than my brother. Um, so it's kind of a May, December painting um, mm -hmm. in the sense of time. The colors here are a little bit more vibrant you know, Claude, that's my brother's name. Claude tends to be um, a lot more outgoing maybe than my dad was, but still, you know, a relatively um, quiet person. You know, he, same sort of pensive qualities as my dad. Um, and I try to reflect that in, in the painting. Whether or not that comes through, I'm not sure. You can tell me. No, I think we totally see, you know, when I looked at these paintings really um, stuck out to me because they, they are very emotional. And you know the 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 colors, but also the juxtaposition of the lines, which have a slightly kind of graphic, but and also cubist feeling to it. But mm -hmm. motion in these, and I know this is a, a evolution of your style. I mean, artists work in lots of different styles, so right. I don't necessarily maybe evolution, maybe not, because there's just different styles. But if we can, um, I know this is um, a painting that you are known for, actually. Um, yes, so that's an earlier, much earlier piece. This I did in the 90s. Um, and I would say that was kind of the style I was working in back then. Um, 
it's funny, I, you know, I feel a certain way about the term style, like, you know, an artist having a style or having a very recognizable look. Um, it's, it's, a, it's good and bad. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's just like being an interior designer. You know, you, you want it, you, it tends to work for you when people want to hire you because they know sort of what look they're going to get. You know, oh, I like his beachy kind of style or I like something very modern or I like a very traditional. So you, you, when you're hiring a designer, you want to know what their style is. As an artist though, it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's kind of a hindrance to creativity. Mm -hmm. To be creative, you want to try something different. So you, you, you kind of have to play with your style a little bit. So I think for me, it's more about my voice. And I think my voice is more consistent through the paintings, yeah. but the styles change a little bit. Um, but I'm okay with that. That's, that's good. I mean, the, the idea of the voice. How would you describe your voice then? Let's look at another painting. Yeah. Uh, so this one is something a, a little more current. Um, it's called social distancing. So this one I actually started a long time ago, put it aside, and then I recently reworked it, you know, through in, in this lockdown. Um, but to me, this is a little bit more, as I said, the, the style is a little different than the one we just saw. The, the market sellers, um, but my voice is still sort of the same. You know, it's, it's, it's an African-American woman, she's reading, um, the colors are sort of vibrant, and to me, dark at the same time. You know, it, it's, it's got these sort of bright colors in it, but it's, it's kind of a quiet painting overall. At least that's what I was attempting to do, was to try to find a way to combine some sort of vibrant colors, but still make it feel like, you know, this, this person is having a quiet, solitary moment and it's not sad. Got it. That's not a sad thing, that's a good thing. So let's, um, again, we're looking at... Yep, um, I forget what the title of this. Oh, it's called In Your Arms Tonight, yeah. uh, which comes from an old song, In Your Arms Tonight. Uh, but it's... Um, it's two men in an embrace, you know, it's a very intimate sort of a moment. Um, but to me, it's also about the design of it. It's, it's kind of an abstract of a shape. Maybe at first you're not even quite sure what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. You may have to look a little more closely. Um, and that comes from, as I'm painting it, I'm kind of working it out. There's a moment where I'm like, well, this isn't quite clear. Maybe it's a little too muddled. Maybe I need to identify a little more clearly what's happening here. Mm -hmm. And then I stop and I think, no, I don't want to do that. I, I want you to figure out what's happening here. Um, but it definitely is a moment of, of kind of an intimacy. Um, and I'm and feeling, you know, there's a lot of, you said quiet on the last painting, but I mean, I, I'm feeling there's this just this kind of, um, it's not reserved, but it's definitely, maybe it is a quietness. Maybe, you know, there's an intensity, but you know, we're, we're looking at these paintings that just kind of have this, a slight breath, you know, uh, that we're taking and we're, you know, a pause, mm -hmm. particularly this one. I even think the title has something to do with being- Meditation. Uh, meditation, yeah. Yeah, this one's called Meditation. There's this meditative quality in, in all of your work, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I'm, I wasn't necessarily going for that with everyone, but I think, yes, I think when I look, stand back and look at it or try to look at it somewhat with an outsider's eyes, I can see that. Um, with this one, for sure, this is called Meditation, The Cut. And it's actually just a friend of mine. I went with him one day uh, to the barber to get his hair cut. I haven't been to a barber in years. I know you're gonna find that hard to believe. <laughs> I do this myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was just, you know, it was that moment. It just, you know, he was my kind of barber, by the way. When I would go back in the day, I preferred the barber who was quiet, who didn't really want to chit chat a lot about sports and football. Mm -hmm. And did you see that game the other night? Or, you know, it's just not my thing. This was not that guy. He was very quiet. He did his job. They chatted a little bit, but mostly this was the scene was just you know, Nadia, my friend, was just sitting there, maybe contemplating something in his head. The barber was focused on what he was doing. And I just whipped out my phone and, and snapped a quick picture of it. Um, and this is the result. Lovely. Yeah. So, so this is a good segue, Frank, into 
clearly we're looking at either two black men or definitely two men of color. Yes. Um, and you and I, two black men, um, particularly two gay men living in this world at this time, and it happens to be Pride Month. I'm gonna stop the share and go back so that we can um, okay. share with each other. Um, you know, a as an artist and having a response to what is happening at the times. And so what I'll say what these times are, because maybe you'll watch this at some other point, you know, we're, we're, we've been quarantined because of the coronavirus, uh, which has an impacted people on so many different levels. And now we know factually that it has impacted uh, people of color and particularly black people more, you know, direly than other, uh, other, other communities. Yes. We're also looking at, and we're just going to call it out, you know, we've, we've seen the murder of George, of George Floyd. We've seen Ahmaud Aubrey. We've seen, you know, Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor. Um, and particularly, not, not particularly, but something that I think deserves more conversation is the Birding Why Black incident. Uh, that's not what we're here to talk about, but I, you know, I'm setting the context for this. These are the times we're living in. So I'm really interested in you as an artist, because we look to artists to, for better or for worse, to try to give us some type of salve, right? To some yeah. type of healing that may be un an unfair burden to, you know, you, because you're like, how are you going to deal with it? But can you maybe talk about your, you know, how that factors in to you when you look sure. at the news and be in as an artist. Yeah, it's really hard to avoid, you know, um, as you've shown in, in my, the works of mine, the few samples that you, you've shown there, you know, I'm not particularly political or making any kind of grand statement about the, the outside world. But at the same time, I think I'm really affected by what's happening in terms of, you know, as you said, being an artist of color, a minority. Um, I'm a Haitian American. You know, the Haitians were really the first free black nation in the world. Those slaves revolted long before the American Revolution, the American Civil War. Um, in fact, you know, the, the, the slave owners in, in the States didn't want their slaves to know about those Haitians yeah. because the truth is they revolted against the, the, the slave owners um, with with a vengeance. They knew something I think that we, we didn't want to know. Meaning for me, they sort of knew we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to wipe out these former slave owners because they'll never let us live freely with them. They'll never let us be free. Yeah. We'll never be free and we'll never be equal. Mm -hmm. So they literally, it was a bloodbath. They wiped them out essentially. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't happen here in the United States. You know, there really was a sense of, of, we are going to live up to the ideals of all men are created equal and, you know, all those wonderful things that are written in that constitution and declaration of independence, which were never really true. Not from the beginning. They weren't true, but they were, they were, they were written down they, as it. They weren't true and they weren't meant to be true for everyone. I mean, but it was meant to be something to strive for. Yeah. And I think, you know, once the slaves here, um, and I shouldn't say slaves, the, the enslaved people, um, were freed in the United States, I think they really just wanted to live peacefully and okay, we're going to have our chance and we're going to believe you when you say we can live quietly and peacefully as equals among you. And, and that actually happened for 10 years. <laughs> and then that stopped. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I know I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but to no, me, the history in his life, go ahead. Yeah, but the, the history matters, <laughs> you know, because when you wonder where we are today, I don't think it's a coincidence that we're in this lockdown of COVID-19, which is adversely affecting people of color. You know, who's dying the most? Who's getting sick the most? Who doesn't have health insurance? Yeah. It's the poorest among us, and it's the, the people who have the least, um, who have always been marginalized in this country. Um, and we've been locked down for three months, unemployed, or at very least underemployed. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're watching something we've never seen 
in this way before. We've always known that there's been some, some injustice when it comes to police encounters with black men and women, but specifically black men. Um, I, I think it was, was it Will Smith who said it's, it's always happened. It's just being filmed now. Yeah. It was Will Smith, right? Many people have said that. I mean, it's, yeah. it's you know. Right. It's, uh, but it's true. It, as I say, you know, this time the revolution is televised. No, you, know, is absolutely about, you know, from the early 70s, it's like right. next time the revolution won't be televised. Like, actually, the reason why we're having this moment is because we have these phones and people can no longer, right. um, people can no longer. You can't deny it's happening. Not only can you can't deny it, but the reality is you can't deny our, even our intelligence anymore because that was the whole thing. People knew it was happening, that, right. you know, somehow to be, uh, we have to wait for a white person to validate our truth, right? Yeah. That, that was before. So now you have this phone, right? And you're gonna argue with Apple? You're right. gonna argue with Steve Jobs? Right. You know what I mean? No, and so it just, and so it builds up and builds up. Right. Which I'm, not, I'm trying not to preach here, but. <laughs> preach on. I wanna go back to the Haitian revolution. Um, <laughs> go ahead. I'll tell you what I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is interesting because these are people's lives, right? So, so I'm talking to you. You're a friend of mine. You're an artist. But in your blood, your family's history is revolution. Your parents immigrated. Did they immigrate, because, not obviously because of the first, but because of the challenges with the um, Duvalier, baby doc, right? Uh, or yes. pop doc. Um, oh, doc Duvalier, correct. That's why they left. So they left because of that to have to start as immigrants in this, you know, in the, in the U.S. Right. and trying to get that piece of that American dream. So all that, I mean, it's all that is in you, right? You know, and the fact, when I hear you talk about your father and your mother, you know, what kind of dreams deferred happened or did not happen because of their having to leave that. Now, that was a whole different situation there. But, you know, I actually just saw... Um, and there's some, there's a, you can find it on YouTube, a, a, um, you know, a little documentary on the Haitian revolution. And one of the, and look, it's all about the facts, people. It's all about the facts. The reason why that was so, um, formative, impactful, whatever, is because other countries came in afterwards to make, to make sure that Haiti never gained a solid foothold. Right? right. And right. then years go by, uh, you have all of this, you know, the flight of the um, educated classes and things like that, people, the intellectuals who are supposed to help countries grow. Right. And just, you know, issue after issue after issue, you know, put and then put, you know, nature on it. And then people don't know the ha Haiti had a bill. Oh, back yeah. France. Reparations. Repar yeah, say that word. To the slave owners. Say, uh, let's say it one more time in case people didn't get it. The formerly enslaved people had to pay a government reparations for oh, their what? freedom, not for a year or two. I don't think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, until like the 40s or 50s. Oh, it went, yes, well into the 20th century. The 20th century. Like they were paying for their loss of prop, but paying France because France said, "Okay, you're free, but you owe us money because you took our property, the slaves." Exactly. Away so, from Frank didn't start this. I didn't start this. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I'm. Just, we just here to illuminate. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's insane. That's an insane idea. It sounds insane to us from the outside. But when you look at it, you know, what, what the United States did was insane as well. You know, you look back and they gave nothing to, to the, they freed these American slaves and gave them nothing. I think for, for a minute, there was a little bit of a Homestead Act and a little bit of reconstruction right away, but that didn't last very long and it wasn't very much. And consequently, there's no wealth to pass down. You know, I, I saw a graphic the other day on, on uh, PBS that since 1950s, white household wealth has tripled from 
-hmm. average of about 50,000 household wealth to 150,000. But for black households, it has stayed flat. And flat, not at 50,000, flat at close to zero. Exactly, yeah. Flat at close to zero for 70 years. And why is that? I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but one reason you can't deny is because it goes all the way back to slavery. Yeah. We had no property, we were the property, mm -hmm. and then we, we built had probably the past that. Property. Right. Yeah. Okay, um, let me... <laughs> <laughs> we're a little off topic, but as artists, I think that that all matters. Okay, another sip. I just... <laughs> Uh-oh, something's coming. No. Hey, water. Let's all the same that that is in you right so that yeah. so if we like not if you we see you walking down the street and say hey guy like what's up like all that is walking through you living in you and it comes out in your your artwork mm -hmm. which for me and so people have seen a little bit of it and i want to remind everyone uh the link for frank's website will be in the comments and please go to his website frankhodelandstudio.com <laughs> say it one more time frankhodelandstudio.com there you go Look at uh his work um it is for sale but um we can there people people approach life in different ways and there's also coping mechanisms so it was very interesting to miss, for me to see that there is this stillness that's the other word i was looking for in your work um, there is there is peace, and I'm wondering, is that a coping mechanism for you? I think absolutely. Um, for me, painting is very sort of meditative. Um, you know, it's 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 the place where I'm most most sort of at my at my ease and being myself. Um, when you really get into the flow of it, time stands still. You know, it'll suddenly be three in the morning. And I'm like, I had no idea. I haven't eaten. I haven't done anything. I've been painting. I've been in the zone. You know, athletes talk about that too. It, um, I get it. That's, that's a thing. It's a real thing. How long and can that zone be? Like how long would it, a session be for? It, it can be, it can literally be hours. Wow. You know, it can be six hours or so just, you know, in the thing, um, which is great. So absolutely. It's, it's, it is a way to sort of quiet your mind and get your thoughts out. Um, at least for me, for sure. So it happens to be um, Pride Month. And yes. what I've been really happy to see is, you know, all Black Lives Matter sign, because what everyone knows, like everybody has to be part of liberation. A march yes. towards liberation is what I'm saying. You know, um, I don't want to get into semantics, but you know, this is really about freedom from all different types of bondage across the world. And that's why we're seeing other people, other communities, other races get involved and, and, and start to show up. But given that it is Pride Month, I'm like, I, want, I won't be able to, I'm not going out. You know, I want to, I kind of say, well, maybe I will, but <laughs> if the no. person comes by my house, I'll look out. Wave hi. Yeah, but okay, so let's talk about that being, you know, two proud gay black men. Also, I should shout out, I believe there is, um, there's a lot of, um, particularly in New York, there's a lot of uh, online, uh, you know, webinars and things happening that people can particularly donate to. So I would encourage everyone to, to definitely look that out. I think there is a blackqueertownhall.com that I just saw Bob the Drag King, Queen and Monet Exchange and Peppermint were promoting that. So I encourage everyone to go look for that. But tell me, you know, let's just talk about a little bit about, did, have you, did you ever go to the black, um, like beach party, the black, black pride, which is usually in August. Did you ever go out to those? On Fire Island? Not the one in Fire Island, girl. This is before Fire Island. Oh. Fire Island was trying to be fancy, but, you know. <laughs> um, no, I remember I went to one. No, there was one at, is it Reese Beach? Did you ever oh, okay, there? yes. I haven't gone to that. I've gone to the one at Fire Island, um, but I have not gone to the one at Reese Beach. Yeah. Um, so tell us about, I mean, you've gone to the, the New York Pride, I think, is the biggest, mm -hmm. um, or definitely it's one of the originals. Tell us any of your, you have fun experience and moments 
Well, I don't know all your moments from that, but some... <laughs> oh, you want me to tell all my little stories? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm not that interesting. There aren't all that many fun stories. Um, I kind of tend to like my solitude. You know that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not the party guy. I've never been. I've tried. I've gone to Five Island and I've gone, you know, to, to Reese Beach and things, but never, never for the big parties. I, I'm, I've never really been that guy. Um, with that said, you know, also just being an artist, you know, it tends to be a solitary experience. You're, mm -hmm. you're in your house, you're painting, you know, so the lockdown hasn't been that jarring to me. Um, but with that said, it, it is, it, it, what I miss, I guess, is going out. So after the work day, when you want to go out and meet your friends and have a couple of drinks and, you know, kiki, mm -hmm. um, that's not happening. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that's, that's the part that's missing. And that's the, the sad part. That's the part that really makes this stressful. Yes, yeah, communal yes. bond that's like just not there. Yeah, You're trying There's to no real out. release, right? Yeah. Exactly. No release, no, 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 um, yeah, no, no, you know, just a hug. Can I get a hug? Mm -hmm. You know, but I'm locked in my house and, and that's not <laughs> going to happen. So, you know, it seems like we're starting to loosen things up a little bit right now. I'm hearing about people getting together in Hell's Kitchen outside of the bars, drinking on the streets. You know, it's not legal in New York, but the cops are kind of looking the other way, at least for now, because they have their hands full with the marchers on the other side of town. Yeah. Um, but I've been to a march, you know, I've done that, wore my mask, um, and that actually felt like a really good communal um, bonding experience. I, I was amazed at, at really how great it felt to just get out, be with people, and not for nothing, but to see so many white people marching yeah. you know, down the Upper West Side was incredible and really heartwarming, and it, it made me feel hopeful that, okay, Maybe there, maybe things will be different this time. That this march isn't just for nothing. It's actually going to mean something, some meaningful change. Yeah, that's what I. That's what I. When looking at the news, and I try to, um, what is the right word? Tamper. That's not the right word. Um, mon whatever the word is. Moderate. Moderate. Thank you. Moderate how much news I watch because you can go off and just go crazy. Right. Oh yeah. But it does, it's like this flips. It's, it's like this craziness that you're seeing, you know, it's, it's like it's not stopping like an, another incident like every other day. And then you're seeing a, a concerted effort of different types of folks coming out, marching, saying enough is enough. Yes. So, you know, I believe I'm not a historian, but this is kind of like the summer of 69, right? Where it just you know, that kind of, everything kind of went, Yeah, everything was on the table, right? And it was about trying to like forge a new way forward. And, you know, we did. So hopefully, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is um, uh, the same. So, you know, you talked a little bit about this, um, you know, communal bond and things like that. I I'm wondering if you could touch upon some type of advice for artists who are just beginning or people who are started because you said you know you um you never stopped but you you definitely have reinvigorated or refocused on on painting more yeah. and you know it's interesting for the person who thinks that 40 is too late or 50 is too late you know when you when you're 90 years old you're gonna be like damn that was like i, I had all the time in the world right yeah. so um do you have any kind of advice for people who yeah. are struggling with that creative journey? Well, it's exactly that. You know, 40 is not too late. 50 is not too late. It, 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 it basically, for me anyway, you know, and this is from, you know, a few years of therapy now, um, but it's really about just being who you are and accepting who you are. I can't deny that I'm an artist. I was denying it perhaps or putting it aside for a good long while, but at some point you sort of have to step into who you are and just be that. You know, be that and be all the other things. I am still an interior designer, but I'm, I'm an artist, you know, and, and for me, I define what that is. You don't define who I am. You don't define what kind of artist I am. I will. Mm -hmm. You can have your own interpretation of what I put out there, but it's for me to decide. And I, that would be my advice to, to someone who's starting out is it's not too late. Um, I just stumbled on a book the other day. I just started reading it. 
by a woman called Nell Painter. She wrote a book called white, uh, History of White People. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't read it, but it's on my reading list. Mm -hmm. But um, Nell Painter is a historian and I believe a professor at Princeton. <clears throat> she retired a few years back when she was in her, I guess about 60, and she decided she wanted to be a painter. She enrolled at the RISD, Rhode Island, Rhode Island School of Design, and became an artist, and then wrote a book called wow. Old in Art School. Wow. In her 60s, she started her journey in art, but the book, which I'm reading right now, is basically about, I'm not too old. I'm not too old if it's something I want to do. It's not, you know, well, you not know, even another take on this is for me in my life, it's only now that I actually have something to say. <laughs> I mean, I've had yeah. to say my whole life, but now I actually feel no people should listen. Yes. <laughs> and I feel like I have the skill. You know what I've learned. Yeah, yeah. I have the skills to put it out in the world with a purpose that's connected to what I feel my purpose is. You know, for me, I, as an attorney in entertainment, you know, I work with so many creative people and I've always tried to help to shepherd, you know, sometimes I get paid, sometimes I don't, you know, right. most of the time I don't, but just try to shepherd creative people into the world because I feel that's my purpose. And right. now, you know, particularly with all this going on, I look at people and I say, you know, you may not be marching, you may not be in that front line, but what is your front line, you know, in this, this is revolutionary daydreams that's not meant to be political at all, uh, because I think the most revolutionary thing you can do is be your authentic self, right? And so with that, what are you doing? What's your front line for what we're experiencing today. What's your advocacy? In terms of being my authentic self? Well, I mean, is that could that could be it. So, you know, in terms of being, you know, what's your contribution to, I don't want to say the struggle, but you know, it's not that. What's your contribution to the march towards liberation? Wow, it's putting me on the spot. Well, honestly, um, I'm, I know the answer. We just been talking. <laughs> I've, I've been having these conversations with my nephew, who's you know he's 16. Um, he he's 16 and he's like over six feet tall. He's got this great big beautiful afro, um, and I worry for him. You know, I see him going out there on the streets, and I I know that he's only 16, but he looks like he's 25. Mm -hmm. And I've had to tell him, essentially. That's not how you're going to be seen when you're out on the streets. They don't see you as a 16 year old. They're seeing a grown black man coming at them on the street mm -hmm. and it's not safe. And, and it breaks your heart to want to have to do that. Um, and yeah, I know Uncle Frank, you know, he tells me, yeah, I know, I know. But we've been having really good conversations in terms of um, him educating himself. You know, he's like, recommend some books. What should I be reading? What should I be watching? You know, I, I told him, you, you know, you got to read some James Baldwin. And, you know, I am not your Negro. You should watch that. You know, and, and he's been doing <laughs> Yes. Uh, the 1619 Project from the New York Times. I'm like, read that. Um, and I think just that, just the fact that he's aware that he doesn't know everything, but that he needs to sort of educate himself and he needs to walk through the world differently than a person who's not a person of color um, okay. is, is sort of how I, I think we have to contribute. We've already fucked up his world mm -hmm. and we've, we've screwed up the world for his whole generation. And I told him, you're gonna have to fix it. Yeah. We're not gonna, we're, it's too late for me and my generation to fix it. I think it's on you guys. Yeah. It's on the 16 year olds, the 20 somethings, the 30 somethings to kind of make it better. Uh, um, I'm sorry for what we did. I'm sorry, but well, it really is our generation. I think part of what, um, I'm gonna disagree with you a little bit because- How dare you? Stuff, <laughs> stuff, was, um, stuff was in a, in a uh, stuff was breaking down long before your mom and daddy was even thought of. You know, yes. I mean? like this is like, this is, this is 600 years. And I say 600 because, you know, enslaved people, you know, first Africans came in this country 401 years ago. But 600 years, we're talking about um, 
if you follow the work of Dr. Cheryl Grills that talks about how this anti-blackness, anti the root of anti-black racism goes way back and is part of like systems, right? Yeah. But I think to bring it to what you're talking about, just the fact it's so important and we can't lose it that you have to have those conversations. And I thank you for having the conversation with your 16 year old nephew because you have, you know, you, we have this wealth of knowledge that we may, we've had lots of conversations with our family over the years, how to survive, how to live, how to, you know, find your way in this world. But I, I think our generation, you and I, did not have the, how to be an advocate, right? How to like, you know, protest because when we were born, we were born just right after it. Like I was born in 1970 and it was like a great new world. Um, right. We were post-civil rights kids. Uh, so, you know, so I, so I think that that's just really, really important. And, you know, and I thank you for having those conversations with your, yeah. with your nephew. And I'd also say too, Frank, um, I'm going to put you on the spot, but I mean, your art, you know, I, that's why I think it's so important. The fact that your art, I can look at your work, experience it, and have some type of healing effect, I think that is so powerful. Yeah. Um, you know, recently the work of Titus Kafar was on the cover of Time, and I think the piece is called um, this painting is not for sale. And it's basically a painting of a woman holding a child and, it, and it's a vacuum. There's no child there. It's just the outline of a child. And he wrote this be really beautiful poem. And you know, you're doing the same thing. And it's not necessarily about, um, and this is a point I really want to get home. It's not about being Oprah, being on the news every five minutes. It is about having the, the, the bond, the touch, the conversation with the people in your network, right? right. That's what's so important and we can't, we can't lose that. So I, I just want to thank you for doing that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think, and I think you're right. Just real quick, I think, you know, I, I don't think you disagreed with me entirely. I think we both are on the, kind of the same page that in the 60s, they were doing the marching and then I was born in the late 60s. I never marched before. I, I think we kind of dropped the ball is my, my, you know, my point to him was that we didn't keep it up. We kind of thought it was over. And then we elected a black president. Mm -hmm. Post racism world, everything's great, you know, and it's not. And we see that now. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go with the fact that, um, you know, art, the power of art in challenging times can, you know, be a beacon. Yeah. And I want to thank you for thank you. joining me in Revolutionary Daydreams. This was and, fun. And being one of my first <laughs> on the relaunch. <laughs> thank you. And I just want to remind everyone to make sure you go to frankhodelinstudio.com to check out Frank's work. And you can be in contact uh, with him through his, through his website. Yes. He's also a great interior designer. And um, I want to remind everyone that this is also a podcast and a vlog. There's so many different terms, but uh, make sure that you subscribe whenever you see this officially and make sure that you continue to listen to the podcast. And if you have any type of uh, requests that you would like to see any particular artist or have me talk to anyone, please just let me know. So uh, Frank, you have a fabulous day. Go back in the zone, making some beautiful art. And bye to everyone from Revolutionary Daydreams. Thank you.